and welcome to the home base meetup we're very glad to have you here on february i hope that you are all uh, we are very fortunate where i am i can actually see the sun for the first time in a week um, it has been a, a good thing to see i hope everyone out there is getting the same experience um, but my understanding is is that there's some ice on the way um, so welcome to our february meetup session we're very glad to have you. This is Wednesday. This is our double dose of home-based meetups where you have power school in the morning and then learning.com will come in the afternoon. You see the bit.ly to this slide presentation as well as the sign-in sheet on the bottom right corner. Please make sure that you take time to sign in as well as get a copy of the bit.ly. Next slide, please. There are all our hashtags, call signs, and all those things that we are out there on social media. And please make sure that you are visiting our pages, making sure that you are up to speed with everything we're communicating out there in the virtual world. Uh, there is also the sign in again and the bit.ly to get into the opening slides. Next slide, please. And there is the um, slide for knowing how to navigate on this screen. This screen um, is, if you have a question, please put it in the QA. We're happy to answer your questions. If we don't get to it during the meeting, we will make sure to get you an answer after the meeting. Um, next slide, please. And home-based meetups are really what I believe one of the most important things we do. I do look forward when we can quit doing this virtually and get out and see you across the state because that's when I think that they are most productive. But this is so that we can communicate with you, you can communicate with us, we can get a good field-based example of what's going on out in the world, and we can get good feedback and good collaborative problem solving and networking time. It's a little more difficult to do virtually, but we hope it's a good experience for you. Next slide. And the agenda today is the same as it has been. We'll have the opening and then Justin will take over with the power school slide. We have a lot of guest presenters today that will help us uh, today because of the jam packed agenda we have. Next slide, please. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out is we do not have a training um, session for today. Yeah, and that we have had a lot of training the last couple of weeks. We had a training uh, with the IPT training for new staff members, as well as we have the scheduling training going on right now that just kind of happens that this was the best time to do it. Unfortunately, it happened at the same time as meetup. So we do hope that people will get this recording and, and watch it. This is the week ahead for the home based meetups. You have today, again, the double dose. You have tomorrow is Canvas, and on Friday is Go Open. Um, those are all very good. We hope that you um, are able to come and attend as many of these as possible to learn the full suite of home-based products that we have available to you and how you can best use them to serve the students in your district. Uh, next slide, please. And there is the schedule. We've already done September, November. We are currently midweek in February, and then we have April of upcoming. So please make sure that you have on your calendar April 26th through 30th. And right now we are still doing that virtually again. Um, next slide, please. These are the great resources we have out there for digital teaching and learning. Please make sure you are visiting those this site so you can get to the light your way forward and all the resources we have out there for remote learning and resources information. Next slide, please. I'm not sure what happened there. Was that intentional? I don't think so, <laughs> but that's it. It's got active links. One thing I it's will where, start. It's where you're clicking, Justin. You just need to kind of click off the page. Toward the bottom, maybe. Hang on. No worries. Can you use your arrow key on your keyboard? Yeah, I got it. I just need to present again. I paused it.
One thing we do want to tell you about upcoming is February 25th is digital learning day. Please make sure that you are sharing what you are doing with digital learning. We would love to hear how you are using all these tools. Um, and then the OER virtual conference in partnership with the Go Open Virginia on digital learning day is February 25th from 2.30 to 5. If anyone would like to participate, Pam, do you want to say anything else about that? I would say that that's good for now. Please move on to the next slide. As well as there's our home based website where you can get all the resources, especially for this group. If you go to the SIS resources, you can go and learn every all the resources we have out there from SIS for QRDs to course code documentation. But that is where you can get all information home base. Next slide, please. Uh, please make sure you are following us on social media with our Did You Know series, and please help us to get to 500 likes. We are approaching that, and I would like to cross that by the end of the year. Uh, please, next slide. Please make sure that you are also letting us know about lead contact information, and if there are changes, we want to make sure that the right people are listed so we can reach out to you and other districts can reach out to you if they have a question. Next slide. The slide decks for the week will be here. We This is our third presentation, and you can see that we even have Go Open down there for Friday. So you have the slide decks that when you come back at the end of the week, you have this bitly. So please make sure you come back and you can see all the slide decks that were shared, as well as we'll put these recordings out, usually in our Friday message. Next slide, please. And there is our wonderful team. I am the home base manager, Rob Dietrich. And you can see all the folks there that are here to help you. And in this case, um, Justin is the power school business manager. I believe he does an excellent job working with this product. And John, Tessa, and Russell are also highly involved with this product. And I believe we, we are working hard to make sure you get what you need out there. So I am very appreciative of these folks. Next slide, please. That is it. All right. And I do want to say, Justin, can you put your opening piece up? Sure. Before I turn it over to Justin, I just want to make one statement about the RFP process and where we are with that. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone on this call is aware that the RFP process was canceled and it will be rebid. Uh, once more information can be shared, it will be, but where we are right now, again, the RFP process was canceled for the SIS and it will be rebid. Um, and that's all I can say to that. And I will turn it over to Justin. All right, thank you. If you haven't already, I know we've had several that have joined since we started. Um, be sure to sign in using that link there. And if somebody can drop those two links in the chat for me, we'll just move forward. The second link will gain you access to these slides, but we do need everybody to sign in using that first bit.ly link there. Justin, I've already put them in the chat for you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so Rob's already introduced you to our team, um, but today these folks will be helping presentation. Um, we've got Russell, who's come on to talk about some things. Tess and John, of course, are with us every meetup session. So thank you, guys. This is what our, our agenda looks like for today. We're going to start out doing the networking. I know typically we save that for the end when we do have a networking activity, but we're going to start out with that and then wrap up with Q&A later. But Everything there, legislative class size, EOI reports, grade scale setup changes, student contacts update, data audits, and power school upgrade. Those are going to be the topics of discussion for today. And then again, there's no training session for today just because of all the other training that's been taking place. We'll try to have something for our April meetup. Um, I'd like to pull in somebody from power school again if we can, because I think that was beneficial last time. All right, so let's start out with the networking activity. Um, 
I wanted to use this time to kind of get some feedback from you guys because we talk to a small group of coordinators every week, but you know, it's impossible to talk to all of you as often as we need to. So I want to use this time to kind of capture what, what items that you've been facing um, as a result of COVID-19 and the changes to the educational delivery methods. What things do you, are you still having problems with? What items are you just now realizing you're going to have problems with moving into next year, depending on how you're going to have to open your schools um, or the changes that you're making to scheduling so that we can take a look at it as a team and figure out how to come back and provide you with assistance. So if everybody will click on that link. Rob, you want to go through these or leave this link out there and kind of go over it as a team and maybe have a follow up. A lot of good stuff coming in. There's, there's a lot of good stuff coming in. I'm not sure that we can cover all of that right now. Um, I think what I would rather do is look at it and then kind of get back based on what what what's in here. That's that's my thought. Because there's a ton of stuff in there, which is great. Yeah. I'm going to jump back over to the slide deck, but you guys keep on submitting as you please. We'll try to go back internally and review all of these and determine what kind of resources we need to put out or responses we need to provide. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, you can feel free to keep keep going on the Padlet while I go over the next few items. Some of these you sh should be familiar with, but I'll start with legislative class size for spring. Um, we reminded you in the fall that regardless of how you were scheduling, um, still had to be aligned with these requirements. So hopefully for the spring you scheduled as you should have for a regular spring collection. And the numbers there for the current collection are 18 and 21. 18 LEA wide average and 21 individual class size max for K through three. And again, that's K through three only. There's no legislative maxes for any 412 classes. That report, um, it's set in power school to open on March 15th. Um, and this year, I think we're pretty much on schedule to get everything in power school by that date. So I've shared with you before that I don't get the February payroll file until around the second week of March. So I feel like we're going to get that around the 8th of March and be able to submit it to power school and have it loaded prior to the March 15th window. So you'll have all of March and all of April or the second half of March and all of April to make any corrections or put in any tickets with power school that you need to. Um, they have made some changes after some of the tickets that we reviewed from the fall collection. So hopefully between those changes and the guidance we provided, because a lot of it was where folks were scheduling incorrectly. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have a smooth submission. A uh, reminder that the affidavits must be submitted to that class size email address by the superintendents, by, and that's got to be in by the 30th as well. So all of these things must take place by the 30th of April. The waiver requests are submitted to the student accounting. And just don't confuse the two of those because they go to two different groups of people. So no changes for the spring collection. The one new thing that we're hoping to roll out by EOY are these monthly class size reports. And I believe I shared these. If it wasn't at the last meetup, it was at the home base advisory meeting. But we're putting in new monthly reports um, that you can run between those um, October and February submissions or March submissions. These reports are just kind of going to help you keep track every month of what classes may be over so that you can get a handle on it or submit a new waiver if, if that's what's needed. 
but I'll kind of explain to you how those reports are going to look. They're going to be in your state reporting dashboard um, with run dates that will begin the 15th of every month. So just like the, the uh, February report will open on March 15th, your March report will open on April 15th and so on. So the reason of that goes back to the payroll file. I want to make sure that we have time to load it before you can run it. So we're shooting for the 15th of every month is when you'll be able to start running that monthly report. And then it's going to cut off at the end of every month. So you'll have roughly 15 days to review those reports. Um, you won't be able to go back and rerun because by the time you go back to try to rerun it, there'll be a new payroll file that had been loaded. And so the results will be totally different. So 15 days is all you've got, and then you'll be able to review it only. You won't be able to go back and rerun it or make corrections after that 15 day period. Um, and the same with waivers. If you have to request a waiver because the class size went over or your average for the LEA has went over the 18, then uh, you have to submit those waivers to the email address that was on the prior slide. With these reports, um, with your official reports that are due in the fall and spring, you've got multiple views. You've got the K3 average, the KA um, class size, your enhancement teachers. All of that is not necessary for these reports. So what we're doing is we're giving you two views. You're going to have your exceptions report, which is going to show you at the school and district level, you'll be able to see these reports. So your exceptions report is going to show you where you may be over. And then your class size report is just that data dump of all classes, all schools. We're putting that out there so that you can, if you do have something on your exceptions report, you can go back and review that class size report to see where you're over. We're expecting those in QA this month or next month. So I'm hoping we can get these out before EOI, but definitely it'll be in the package so that when we return from EOI, you'll have access to these reports. Are there any questions? As of right now, this is not, I don't want to call it unofficial because I want you guys to take it serious. We put it in there because we know there's districts that are going over between those two um, official reports. So we wanted you to have a tool so that you're not having to constantly go run your own numbers. Um, so it's not like an official you must approve and we're going to review it, but I'm not going to say there won't be times where we have to go and check behind districts. I'll pause there if there are any questions or Rob, if you have anything to add. Good on that one. <clears throat> Tessa, are you seeing any questions or Cammy? Whoever's monitoring the chat. Yeah, there are questions. I'm, try I'm trying to make everyone a panelist that needs to be a panelist. Okay. And set, change the settings. So there are questions coming in. Let me see. And I had to go out and come back in. Um, I don't know if, if I see if Francine has a question on do monthly reports have to be approved. So from what I understand and the pictures that I've seen so far, and these are still in development, so um, not completely sure if they're going to be if there'll be an approve button, but there'll be the run and the review. So I, I think these are going to be reports that just hang out in your queue. Okay, and then I see uh, from Kate legislative class size in spring will be based on what date? Uh, spring is as of February 28th. And jumping back to Francine's question, I'm not going to promise. I mean, if you guys feel that it would be better for you to have an approved button, um, we can definitely make sure that happens. I think the idea when we were working with the development team was if we put approve in there, then you're going to, we'll have folks that think that this is a, an urgent report that DPI is collecting. And, and then it's like there's a question for John, so I'll let John take a look at that and, and if he needs to read it out, I'll read it out later. Okay. I don't. 
Um, if no approval is required, why do we need waivers each month or mark? Yeah. I'm with you on that one. I would want to have an approved button. I wouldn't want anyone not taking that serious when the waivers are expected. And I think because we've got new leadership, it might be a good idea for Rob and I to try to track down the new folks who will be reviewing these reports and seeing what their preference is. I'd agree with that. And we also have a question um, from Sherry. She says, at the beginning of the year, we were told to put the bell schedule and start and end times to what we would normally be meet, meeting if we were to go full face-to-face. -face. With the modified schedule with staggered face-to-face -face dates, the school has gone to a 1 p.m. dismissal each day. Should we leave things in as the full day or change it to the 1 p.m. dismissal? If so, is there a waiver for instructional hours as far as the school calendar goes? Well, I, I think it's safe to say that that's a pretty loaded question. Um, Sherry, is it possible for you and I to have a conversation? Because I'd like to talk to you more about that. Can you shoot me a quick email with information so that we can have a conversation? She says, yes. and I am not sure if there is a waiver for instructional hours as far as the school calendar goes, but I, I will find out because that's a question I'm sure many others have. So we will get an answer to that question. But Sherry, I'd like to talk to you about your specific um, scenario, if that's okay. Just shoot me an email, please. And Mark says, so waivers are expected from superintendents each month. Do they know this is coming? Well, Rob, we can put a message out to superintendents, but it's been part of law since the, the class size legislation came out. Yeah, I think we would need to, I think that's a good idea to draft a message. I think this was our way to make sure that you guys were looking at it every month because we only had Empower School, the collection twice a year, when in actuality the law says it should be looked at constantly throughout the year. So this was our way of helping you look at it constantly throughout the year. Uh, I believe was the vision behind this. Is that correct, Justin? Yes. We will we will communicate that out as this becomes more of a reality next year. And Laura is asking, when is the official report for LCX? Twice a year or monthly? If only twice a year, then we should only have to approve and submit waivers two times. Yeah, the officials are twice a year. We'll, we'll get the communication out that clarifies all that. Yeah. Other class size questions before we move on? Um, Francine wants to know, do we have to approve the monthly LCS reports? Well, we're going to go back and check on that. I think it's a run review. I don't know if it's a, if it has an approved button, but it sounds like just for simplicity, it may be better just to add it. And it looks like that's it for now. Okay. And we can always circle back if there are more questions. Um, this is something new also that's coming in. Um, I don't know when we started working on this, Rob, it's been probably about eight to 10 months ago. Um, well, actually, it came up after the EOI process last year because the current process or the, pr the prior process was DPI constantly um, going through the ODS checking for those SQL 5 reports that you guys have access to. That was always a recommendation, but never a requirement that you run those. So we were pretty much on the back end running those for districts and then calling the districts up and saying, hey, you've got kids that are missing their next grade, their next school. And it was always something that took us right down to the last hour. And I, I'm talking the morning of, we were still calling districts. So we tried to think of a way that we could make this easier on us and you guys, you guys being at the LEA level, because some of our districts are so large, you're not sure if your data managers have run those SQL 5 reports or not. So 
the idea was to kind of put those in a state reporting dashboard so that it is now required. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it's basically the same reports that were in the SQL 5 reports. Um, there will be eight total exceptions, and the exceptions are going to be labeled, as you see there, EPV 1 through 8. We're going to open the report. We're going to open the reporting window on 5.1, but we're going to have them required to be submitted by 6.28. And as we get closer to EOI, we'll talk about a process of locking people out so that if something happens on 6.29, we're not having to rush around and make corrections. Um, so we can talk about that later. But Rob, what did we decide to do? We talked about making this report, forcing it to unlock every night because we don't want you going in on 5.2 and submitting when we know there's going to be changes after. I don't, yeah, I don't believe that the approval button will even be there until 628. Okay. They'll be able to run them, but I don't think the approval button will be there till 628 as it's developed, but we'll verify with that. So we wanted you to have access to these reports as early as May 1st, because we've got a lot of early colleges. Um, and on top of that, for the larger districts, even if you don't graduate until the second week of June, there's probably cleanup that you could start doing in May. So we're going to give you access to these reports in May. You can't submit them until the 28th of June. At that point, we'll talk about how to get everyone out of the instances other than the, the main folks. And I think that might be something that we do at DPI. Maybe on 628 at 5 o'clock, we lock everybody out except for the um, all the technical, the EOI contacts. But we'll talk about that as we get closer to time. Here's what those reports are going to look like. Let's hold any questions until we get through the next two. Okay. Um, you've got your incorrect school for graduates. Next year school not in district. Next year grade invalid for the next year school. No next year grade level. These are going to be the name of the reports and then your Descriptions are going to be displayed as well so that data managers or whoever going through doing the cleanup will know why they have this error. And then the next page, the, the other four, no next year school, no next year school terms, students with invalid demotion codes, and students with invalid graduation date. Um, for the invalid motion codes, for those of you who did run the SQL 5 reports this past year, I know you, you saw the XG pop up as an invalid motion code because a student going from 12th grade to XG, which is considered negative nine, was popping up as an invalid motion code. We have fixed that in the, in the EPV reports, so that won't be an error this year. All right, questions? Um, Francine wants to know, will they be organized so that the list they, they list together on the state report screen? For the well, EPV yeah. reports? I see what you're saying, yeah. And Rob, didn't we decide to do this in a dashboard to where it's one report and then you have... The drop downs? The drop down, yeah. Kind of Correct. Like DMR. And one important thing to note about these reports is it will only produce the ones that are meant to show up on this. So you could run this report and it's blank, but if it's blank, that means that everything is filled out and it's fine. If you run it and then it produces results, those are the ones that you have to fix. So it won't show you all of them. It will only show you the ones that are incorrect. So ideally in this, if you run it and it's blank, that's a good thing. Um, and Mark says, so the whole state will be running and approving EOI reports on 628. Can the system handle that? That's a solid well, point. It is a very good point. Mark, we'll take that back <laughs> to power school. Um, when I brought up the PMR 9 issue, knowing the problems we're currently having with PMR, I was assured that come the end of the year, they'd have everything ready. But. We'll take that back for sure. Um, I wanted to, this is currently sitting in DPI 7, 
and I wanted to be able to show you live, but then I realized that we'd be displaying student data. So I just had a few screenshots we popped in here. You'll notice in that drop down that there's some that's missing. So like Rob said, that means that, let's see, there was not an EPV3 error or an EPV1. It is, it is truly our hope that these help you as you go through the pre -E EOI process to help your folks make sure that they have entered all this information that it is correct. And that way there's not a big rush at the end of the year to get all the information in for some who may have missed a student or two, but this is just a good way for you to check. And to our knowledge, all of these reports capture everything that would possibly mess up EOI process. For a school or a student, but if there's others that you can think of, shoot us an email. We might squeeze it in for next year. All right, I'll move on and we'll circle back if any other questions come up. Um, grade scale adjustments are needed. I put the big red take action button on there. Stamp. We've already heard from several districts um, concern around the PC-19 and WC-19 still being available and a teacher's drop down so they can, they can still see their assignment grades. So we need, we need to fix that. Several of you already have, I think. Tessa and John, are my steps pretty accurate there? I know y'all had a good yes. handle on it. The only thing I would say is do not delete the one with the PC-19, WC-19, you're just duplicating it and then you leave that one and assign the newly duplicated one without the PC-19 and WC-19. Yeah. We went through several different processes of trying to correct the problem without doing this, but we found that the PC-19 and WC-19, if you uncheck those from your current list, then it's no longer recognized as recognizing prior courses to being complete. And so it messes up your transcript. So the only way around it is to duplicate the special code scale, remove those from that scale, those PC-19, WC-19 grades, and then tying the new one back to your default 10 point grade scale. Questions there. Um, Mark is asking, so do we need to recheck those grades in our current special codes if we had unchecked them previously? Um, yes, so in the original special code scale that you have attached with those, check those and then just duplicate that scale, remove them from that scale and attach the newly duplicated scale to your 10 point scale. And we had talked about modifying the existing QRD, um, but I think it's pretty much straightforward. If you have, if you have the existing grade scale for special pro or not special programs for spe special codes, you should be able to follow that QRD and move forward with this. Well, I think we we could probably create a new QRD with some screenshots and share that out just to simplify it. Yeah. Yeah, that's not like to see that, that would be good. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, student contacts. Last time we talked, we said that we were going to remove that custom page for the custom contacts on January 29th for everybody. Um, as we got closer to that date, we were getting contacted by districts. Some internal um, teams were not completely ready for the cutover. So we realized that we couldn't do it all together on that date, just drop dead. But we at least were able to come up with a compromise 
and Lorenzo with PowerSchool, um, he created a plugin that was installed on that maintenance weekend and we put information out on, I believe it's disabling, no, it's enabling the plugin. It was a little backwards the way the plugin was deployed. It was not turned on. So by default, you still had access unless you wanted to go and enable that plugin that he put out there. So if you are ready to hide that contacts page, you currently have that ability if you've not done it already. And I've not checked in a week or so, but last I checked, I think we had about 40 districts who had already turned that off. So that happened on the 29th and on the 2nd, your new standardized relationship types were deployed to all instances. So those are out there now in your drop down. We're trying to get everybody to a single list, which is on one of the next slides, but where we are right now is helping you map those contacts. We put that out as part of what you can expect for us from us. So right now, basically what we did, we pulled out all of the contacts that exist right now, the relationship types rather. And if they were simple enough to where I knew that step hyphen father was equivalent to stepfather, I went ahead and mapped all those in a spreadsheet. Um, legal guardians were mapped to guardians, just like sitter was mapped to babysitter or caretaker. I did all of the ones that were kind of common sense and delivered those back to power school. We tested that in DPI seven. I think there's a meeting going on right now where they're finalizing approval for production push. So I'm hoping the mapping can take place tonight. So that'll knock out over half of the, um, the errors that we had when we first pulled the relationship types, but there's going to be some other files coming out from our ECATS folks. I think we're going to deliver those through the EMFTS. And that's going to tell you all of the problems that ECATS is seeing. And I can't remember all of those errors, Rob, do you know it? It was basically like the, the lives with check boxes, um, more, more in the weeds. I know a lot of districts said that part of the problems that they are expecting to see in this file are things that have been that way for years. So it may or may not be a big deal, but we want to be sure you have the file and see what will be broken once we finally do pull the plug on this. No, I think you summed that up quite well. I think that was <clears throat> that was a good recap. And and just remember that if you are a district that has chosen to go ahead and hide that screen, please communicate that with your EC folks so that they have an idea to kind of be on the lookout uh, with the, the guardian and parent contacts that may be made to make sure they're accurate. Okay. Jumping back up to the mapping. So what's going to take place tonight is all of those that I shared, but if there are some out there that we didn't map for you, they're going to be set to not set, which will be default. It'll default to blank in the drop down. So for all the baby daddies in the contact world, they will be set to not set. And then we will give you a list of those that were not recognized so that you can go back and and change those to whatever you need to. So after that's done and you've received both of your files, because um, we will give you a file from PowerSchool and from ECATS, um, the next steps are going to be to remove all of the remaining relationship types that aren't aligned with the standardized list, as well as remove that NC contacts page. And these are the relationship types that were pushed out through the enterprise controller. So once all, all the cleanups done, these are going to be the one, only ones we expect you to use. Questions on contacts. Mark, Mark would like to know where ECATS is pulling from. Is it now pulling from core contacts? They have not made that change yet. But they do know that there are several districts no longer looking at the custom or updating the custom. 
and Francine is asking about when we will upgrade, um, but I, I believe you have that on yeah, the slide for later. Okay. So Mark wants to know, how are they providing ECATS errors? Um, it, it's basically a file of what they know when we cut over will continue to be an issue. And like I said, some of them, like the lives with, I know that's that's one that a lot of districts have not been checking all these years. I think more or less before we pull the plug all together, they just want everybody to know, hey, this is what we're recognizing and may not be accepted once we start looking at the core page. Um, Don is asking, can we also remove all students who are linked as family? I'm not sure, Don, can you clarify that question? Um, Carrie is asking for the contact cleanup. We used to have a verification report that we could send home with each student that pulled what was currently in our system and a column for updates. It would be wonderful if we had this again with the core contact data provided. Yeah, we can take that back. Uh, Dawn is clarifying. She said we have many different baby daddies and when we make a change at one school, it changes data for all who are linked as siblings. Now say that again. She was asking originally, can we also remove all students who are linked as family? And her clarification was oh, that when they have a... I see what you're saying. Yeah. Mm, let's let, yeah, let's ask that today. Yeah, check on that because there used to be an option to not link update all siblings. Yeah. Yeah, we need to figure out what the impact will be there. Yeah, good point. Thank you. You have more questions? Francine says there are a couple reports from PS source that list the info from new contacts. I'm not sure if that was in response to Sherry or Carrie's question though. We can see what kind of resources are available that'll help with the new contacts. All right, the next um, item. Sorry, oh. one more comment. Mark says, do not remove the link. One contact, many different students. That's the whole point of core contacts. The whole reason we consolidated those duplicates <laughs> to begin with. And that's it for the comments. True. All right. This page, this is um, DPA, and we've, we've started. Go ahead, somebody have a comment. Okay. Um, we've not started this yet. We've just, um, we're going to start conducting PSU data audits. And so we've kind of, started taking a look at what's out there now. And Russell and Rob are gonna share more about the plan here. Yeah, let me start off. A, a couple of things have been coming up a lot lately. Um, one is the data request that I, I know is floating around out there. And then the second is the PEBT. And what I can tell you, uh, probably more so in the last six months than, than I can remember, and Justin, Tessa, and John can take it back even further, is that people are asking for the data and they're pulling the data a lot right now, especially around attendance, especially around um, addresses, obviously, for PEBT. And as we started looking at data, and um, 
I debated how this was going to come across as I was having this session, and I hope that this comes across the appropriate way. We're trying to set up systems to help you understand where there might be some holes in your data so there can be accurate and consistent data so that when data is pulled, if we give you, if we're doing data audits, um, as well as you have access to data audit reports, which is the third bullet there that I'll let Russell explain shortly, that it helps keep your data clean and helps you identify those areas that are pulled frequently that you you know may be coming. And we're trying to give you an avenue to see that on a regular basis so that you can work with your data managers to get that data corrected and accurate. Um, I'll give you an example of one that I was working with just yesterday um, that I encourage everyone on this call uh, in webinar to please go back and review the calendars in your district. We are finding that there are many schools that do not have a calendar day type. It's blank or it, it may be incorrect that if you are truly a remote district, please make sure that that calendar day type says remote instruction day that the box is checked for in session and that your calendars are set up right because we, we have found is that there are a bunch of schools out there that have blank calendar day types. Um, and that's that's data that's being pulled quite frequently. Um, so our hope is, is that as we start to do this data audit process fully implemented next year, that we're providing you a way to make sure that the data you're looking at is good, you know where your holes are, and I understand that some things are gonna have holes. Um, I looked at plenty of birth certificates that didn't have a dad on it. Um, there, there are times where certain holes can be explained, but I also know that you as the coordinator can understand that when you see some holes, those can be explained and there are some that can't. So it's my goal that this will help. Um, for example, with the EBT poll, I know the addresses is, has become a big deal, making sure that the addresses in there are correct. Uh, so those these are things that we hope help you through that, that data process that you have in your district. Justin or Russell, would you like to add anything? Russell, do you have anything? I'll add to what Rob just said. Uh, do you add and show? Do you want to go ahead and show some of the reports we've been working on? Sure. We do have some questions. And do you all want to answer these questions before going to Russell's part? Let's, let's let Russell go and then we'll answer them afterward, please. Okay, so working with Laura Pipe at DPI, we have been writing some new SQL reports. What you can see in this particular file is a list of some of those reports which have been written. Currently, these reports do not pull students who are uh, students who you may have no-show, they only pull current year students and pull students who are uh, in your program schools. Each report pulls all of the data from all of your schools at one time. Now, the reason for some of these reports, as Rob's already said, call we're seeing missing data. Seeing blank entry codes and student records we're seeing, uh, now these don't pull this particular one to mention but we schools that have not chosen a bell schedule for their pmr and sar calculation minutes there are incorrect FERPA entries uh, on the one that you see as invalid release info i Spot checked some schools the other day with that one, and a lot of them was completely empty and have no no check at all. One of the things Lori has told us with the invalid the, the invalid college release, the military recruitment, the release of info, is that the 
actually some incorrect codes in there. Some of them are using numbers or letters that they should not use. And she was not sure if that's because the data was imported or, or what the issue was with those. I know a lot of you have been asking for a null mailing address report. So we just took the, the physical mailing address and created a null mailing address with that. We have, uh, we do father and mother, the null father or mother does not pull when there are some issues with the original type that's on the mother thought. And we're not really sure how to correct that other than as Mark has already told some of you in the Google group to change it to a different original top, save it, change it back to mother or father, save it and bring it back. So been but for a possible invalid date of birth of grade or grade, what that report does is it looks at the person's grade level and it looks at the person's age. And if they don't match up, if they're group, uh, the grade level and the age looks like it's off, then it actually pulls that data and it is pulling some data for students. Uh, for instance, we're seeing some 21 year old in kindergarten and we're seeing some other issues with the grade level as opposed to the date of birth and age. So we have in our, our Q&A system right now and like I said, current only, current, current year data only. Rob, I'll stop there and let you go on with it. Yeah, I think, I think that, and, and Russell's doing a fantastic job kind of pulling all this together and, and getting this ready because what I, what I want to have, I, I have, um, any of you know me or knew me when I was out in the district. I spent a lot of time going around the schools and just checking on my folks, you know, seeing how they were doing, especially the, the first part of the year. And I remember walking in all their <laughs> data manager offices and I would see QM folders stacked all around and they're plugging away, putting folks in as fast as they can to make sure they can get them a schedule. And then they'd have their own system set up to go back in and check and double check. And I understand the pressure that's on them to get that work done. So we just thought that as we have seen this data get pulled, as we've seen issues come up, the, the best way for us to address that is to do spot check data audits ourselves and then to make available to you all the data audit reports that we would be looking at. Um, and then the long-term goal of this is the location of the DPI audit files in the EMT, EMFTS is that as we run these data audits and as these data audits produce results, we will drop these automatically in a folder for you so that you can go grab them and you can see exactly what's missing and exactly what needs to be fixed or needs to be looked at. Um, and, and that is really the goal of this is to help everybody get clean data. So when the data is pulled, it's as clean as possible um, based on the information that you have at the time. And then I see one question as I'm looking at a chat of when will all these SQL reports be loaded into our PSU or will they, they will all be loaded into your PSU once they have all passed QA. And that's why the goal for these is fall 21, 22. You may see them before, um, but you will definitely see them next fall. Our hope is, is that we can get these through QA pretty quickly and get these in your hands so that you have them because we think these will be very helpful to you and I hope you you see that as such. There's also a question is if if these can be run both at LEA level and at school level. That's a good question. I want to say they can both be run at the LEA level and the school level, but I don't remember. Does anybody else know the answer to that question? Regardless of the level you run them at, I believe they still pull all the schools, no matter where they run. I'll run okay. one real quickly, right? You know. Okay. And that is something that we need to work on then, just so that if they're running at the school, they only see their school's information, if that's the case. 
So again, that's why we're telling you now, because we've got to work through all those bugs as well. And they're confirming that school level shows total district. Okay. So um, we'll work on that. Uh, my hope is, and you guys are a pretty vocal group. It's one of the reasons why I like you so much. Um, our hope is, is that you believe these will be beneficial for you. Um, please let me know if you believe it. Uh, I think it is good to mention uh, one of the ones, I'll give you an example of one that, that the reason we are running some of these is the null date of birth. We actually saw a case this year where there was a third party vendor enrollment that was importing into PowerSchool a 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 date of birth. Um, and we weren't catching it until we saw it on some, some data reports. So that's why it's important to have these reports out there for you to look at and for you to view, because you need to make sure that your third party vendors that you have doing some of those things for you automatically, that it is reporting the way it should and that you don't get surprised by a, a phone call from someone on, on our team that says, by the way, you have 150 bad date of birth, and then we have to track back and go fix it. So. Um, that's why some of these reports where y'all might be shaking your head going, what in the world are they running that for? The system doesn't even allow it. Well, sometimes we have seen with the third party vendors that it is being allowed. So this is just our effort to help you clean up your data. Oh, the good question. Anita Willis asked a good question. If the report is an EMF, EMFTS, will we be notified or should we be checking periodically? Uh, I think we're still working through that process. I don't know that there's a way for us to right now to tell you that you have been notified, but ideally even longer term, I would love to make it so that you are notified whenever we drop stuff in there. But as we start to work through this process, because I think it's important, we're, we're going to try to hopefully be able to create something that will notify you right now. I would say you have to check periodically. And I wouldn't do that until we have really started this process next year, and we'll let you know. Yolanda, are you, are you familiar? Did I get notified? I don't think they do. I think you have to check, but I can follow up on it. Okay. What we are most likely to do once we set this up, if it's automatic, is put a message out that says, hey, we ran the data reports, and they're sitting there. Um, for everybody to look at. So as we begin to work through this process, what we're trying to do is kind of get at ahead of the game a little bit to where we're not saying, all right, they're out there, you guys go, and then we haven't really told you about it. So we're we're trying to just make sure that, that we're trying to stay ahead of the game with you guys as well. Rob, Anybody look, Rob, I'm looking at new reports that have been created. And it does look like some of these new ones have been written in a way that you can run it only at the school level or at the LEA level. Okay. That's good. And we probably just want to take that to, to the older reports as well, but we'll work on that. Um, I also see a good question out there. We've got the null mother father audit report. And Wendy asked if there's a way that they can exclude students that truly have like no father listed so that they're not always coming up in that audit report. I, I actually thought that was a good question too. Um, I saw that, sorry, I didn't address it earlier. Thank you, John. Um, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to have to take that back to power school because that's a core field. So what, what I believe you're asking for, which isn't a bad idea is a checkbox under mother or father that says null value okay and you check that box and that should tell everybody that there's no father or mother on the on the birth certificate is what i'm assuming you're looking at but we are going to have to take that back to ask the question um because that one might take a little bit longer for us to do because it is a core power school product but yeah. it's a good point um and I did drop a link there to the QRD on how to gain access to the EMFTS. 
most of the power school coordinators should already have access, but that was as of probably a year and a half, two years ago. So you may want to make sure you do have access, and if not, go ahead and request that access because the 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 um, contact files that we're going to be delivering will likely go out this way. So you'll need it before these audits begin. I know this is probably not quite a little off topic. I know a lot of you have received um, it's off topic, but on topic, I guess. I know a lot of you have received a records request uh, that's asking for a lot of data. What I can tell you from from our side is I can't provide any information to that request, but what I can do is kind of say where you might pull that information and where all of you might be pulling that information from. Um, as I looked at that request, I saw that you would probably be using your enrollment data on the PMRs, your average daily attendance off the PMRs, and the store grades table to get the grading information um, if you have those uh, available. Uh, the only thing that I probably couldn't help you with at, is the mode of instruction that occurred because the mode of instruction this year has been very much a locally process piece you guys kind of figured things out because we didn't put out that learning preferences page until october um but that that's that's what i have to say on on the data request topic um any other questions on the data audit before we move on Where do we request access for the DPI audit files? Um, you would, I believe Justin's got that link how to gain access to the EMFTS. That's where we will be dropping them. So as long as you have access to that, you would be able to get that information. And once the, uh, once the relationship type files are ready, I'll put this link in that communication as well, so you'll know how to go access that. And you guys are asking a lot of good questions and you guys have got a lot of stuff um, that we have to go back through. So I don't know, we'll get all of it by the Friday update, but hopefully you would see something from us um, Monday or Tuesday of next week that to answer a lot of the questions that have been asked here today. All right. So for our power school upgrade, um, timeline is still up in the air, but when we do upgrade, we're going to want to upgrade to the latest and greatest. And right now that's 20.11.1. There are some discussions about a dot four, I think. release that may benefit us. So once we find out what it is. Um, Justin, you cut out. So I don't think anyone heard anything you said. It might have just been me. I'm not sure. No. I can start over. <laughs> um, we are looking to upgrade. The timeline is up in the air. But when we do upgrade, it'll be 20.11.1. That, that's as of now. I think there may be a dot four that's on the horizon and if it's close enough to where we can get that on our test environment, we'll take, we'll take the latest, depending on what's in the release notes. But we do know that there's lots of updates in the 20.11.1. Many of them we've been looking forward to for quite some time, which will include the, the ability to um, not transfer student contacts and not transfer the information in the student learning press table. A lot of the stuff that automatically transfers when you click the transfer students record button um, will have the ability to disable once we move to this version. I have dropped a link there in the release notes. Um, right now, if we can get the environment stood up quick enough, we'd love to target the spring break um, window somewhere within those. Justin, you cut out again. Yeah, Justin, you cut out again. 
Well, somebody else take that slide. <laughs> I haven't moved. <laughs> Um, essentially, we're working on, there's lots of updates. You get the ability to control the student data transfer, which I know everybody's been wanting for a while. We've added the release notes there for you to see. I believe in there, and somebody please tell me if I'm incorrect. I believe they also have a way now for teachers to report incident referrals from Power Teacher Gradebook as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, Russell. Our target is spring break or EOI. What this all hinges on and the amount of time that we could get it, it depends, we need a second test environment so we can continue the testing we're doing now and then have a second test environment where all they're doing is solely testing on the upgrade so that we can get it out in a timely manner because it's very difficult for us to stop all our testing on one and then move it to the upgrade. So we need to run the two in parallel and that's really what we're waiting on. And once we are able to achieve that and get that, we'll be able to give you a much more solid timeline of when we are expecting to have it. But right now, uh, we are still looking at spring break or EOY as our target, because once we do get that second test environment, we will hit it hard and try to get it out to you as soon as possible, because I know everybody would like to see this upgrade. How'd I do, Justin? Is that pretty good? You did good. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Did Russell want to add anything to the upgrade topic? Not at this I know time. He'll be leading the project. Okay. Thank you. All right. Lastly, um, Tess, I know we've got some training going on for scheduling around scheduling, but looking through some items last night i did find that in on the power school insider one of the episodes that was most recent it's a special edition it was about an hour and a half um, insider episode of how to build schedules so for those who may not have been able to send everybody to the training it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to if they have access to the power school community to have them go in and watch that episode and then i put some links in there that are related to the topics we discussed today. The Tim's setup was one that we didn't cover, but that was part of the contacts cutover. So if you've not got your Tim's piece set up and ready to pull from the core contacts, then you'll need to follow that QRD there. John or Tessa, anything training related that we want to add? Nothing that I can um, think of at this time. Go ahead, John. I don't believe so. Uh, I'll mention I do want to update that EM FTS document for the instructions for our Mac users out there. Um, so I'll work on that. But okay. Any questions, or Rob, do you have anything to add? Um. Mm -hmm. Please do send us your questions. I don't know we can get to all of them here. Um, but do please send us questions. I knew we gave you a lot of information today. Um, I know we gave you a lot of things that we we're working on and, and wanting to see happen. Um, I do want to thank you for your time. I do want to thank you for allowing us to share these items with you and hope that they will be um, seen again, as a way to help you in the future. And that's about all I've got. And I think what we'll do is we'll go back to the Padlet activity. We'll kind of go through all the, the topics there that you guys left, the feedback that you provided. And we can probably, from that, try to put together a training session for the next meetup. So do expect there to be the CEU opportunity on the next go round. If you wouldn't mind before you drop, um, just cl click on that link there to provide feedback for today's session.
Justin, you have a couple of questions. You want to take some questions? Sure. Um, when will EOY be, if you know? Uh, let me pull it up. What's the next one? I'll come back. Now. Okay. Is ECAS still pulling from Guardian email? They are, aren't they, Rob? I think that's part of it. I believe that that's part of it, but we'll verify. All right. Do you have any comments on the summer school and power school? I do not, but I just heard something yesterday about summer school. And I do think there'll probably be some information coming soon on that. Okay. Um, can run UNC happen more often daily, weekly? I know typically as we get closer to EOI, I think we try to set that up to run more often for the graduating students. That's one that I wish we could automatically run nightly, but right now it's just set to to run when store uh, when grades are stored. But we can ask how often that can be done without causing performance issues. Okay. And um Last one, I think there might be some earlier ones, but I'm sure we're downloading the chat. So we'll have the questions to follow up on. Um, I am unable to transfer any student records since the new contacts type was pushed to us. Is anyone else reporting this issue? And this person has a ticket with PowerSchool. Yes, it's been it's been reported. I think there are a couple of cases with PowerSchool. Okay, um, can you put the QRD for special code links in the chat? I think maybe John or Chester can do that. And um, there's another question about training. Will there be, will there be new data manager training offered? Web training for new data managers will be greatly appreciated. Tess, do you want to have uh, that one? Or John? I can jump in on the, the special codes QRD and, and the updates to that. Um, I know we need to work on getting that out there. Um, we don't have one just yet, but we should have that very soon. Um, and new data manager training, we can look at that. Or I see Tessa's unmuted if, if she has a comment there. Yeah, I was now we do have um, new. TC training. So if they're a TC, um, they go through the IPT training and that training is set up as a train the trainer kind of training. So we would be training the technical contacts in power school who would then go back and train their people within the PSU. And going back to EOI, it looks like uh, June 30th is the day. Okay, that's all the questions there. If you want to jump to the padlet, I think. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> Has there been a fix for certain staff to view only incidents and not have full access? They're getting a lot of complaints. Repeat that. Has there been a fix for certain staff to view only incidents and not have full access to incidents? Rob, I don't even think that's anything we've been, that's not been on our radar, has it? No, it hadn't been on our radar at all that I know of. Um, if, does, do you have a ticket out there that you reported at the power school? If you do, please drop that in the chat so we can get on that with power school. All right, and Tessa, the training, uh, where is it listed? It's on the calendar. I just answered that in the chat. It's, Thank you. This is the training. It's the initial product training, the certification training that is communicated out in our Friday bulletin when when it's available. So it looks like we're offering it two times a year, which is for now it's February and August, I think will be the next one. Um, but 
don't hold me to those dates because we haven't actually nailed down the summer dates yet, but we will communicate that out whenever registration is open and available. We'll communicate that out in our weekly bulletin and it's on our training calendar as well. Yeah. Right, and just, just let you know that um, Francine said back that the issue, Power School Help Desk said the issue with admins having full access to incidents was a DPI request. So she doesn't have her ticket number right now, but maybe we can, she can look it up later. Or okay. gateway power. Send me that case number, Francine, if you don't mind. And if somebody's asking, is it okay to use the consolidate function? They've been advised from Power School not to use it unless absolutely necessary due to various issues with mother slash father not displaying on transcripts, et cetera. I don't remember if we pulled that from the recommendations or not. Yeah, I don't recall. I know we are running a script to fix the issue with the transcript. If it doesn't seem mother father, it should be running a script to get the mother and father in there. Um, on a weekly basis, so with the other part of the question, we will ask power school that question today and get you an answer uh, later this week or early next week. And Wendy, I see your question out there about how long do you expect power school to be down? I'm assuming you mean EOI. Um, and I'm sure those discussions are happening with power school and DPI will have to have some internal discussions. Yeah, on that length of time. Okay, here's another one. Why does creating a parent portal create an additional contacts that needs to be consolidated? <laughs> We received that one a lot. And I don't think there's a way around it. What did Mark just say there? Mark says, adding to the contacts issue, having them not linked to multiple siblings would also create issues for parent portal access. If not one contact from multiple siblings, they would have to have multiple parent portal contacts for each child. That's right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We know the specifics behind why does creating a parent portal create an additional contact that needs to be consolidated. But again, we can ask power school that. We're going to have to go through this chat today and determine what questions we need them to answer and we'll give it to them in a document. Yep. Yeah. And add add script to that same issue. Yep. Mark is saying it's because parent portal accounts don't require a first and last name. There's no way for the creation by a parent to search. Or an existing contact. That's all that's in there right now, Justin. There's some more coming in, but I believe we're probably to a place we can end. And then if you have other questions, you can send them our way. We'll go through the chat and download this and have have the recording hopefully ready to post by Friday. And like I said, we'll go through the Padlet activity internally and decide which of those items we can pull and try to offer more resources on or provide training in April during our meetup session. Anybody else from the team have anything to add or share? I'm good. Awesome. All right, folks, if we don't see you before, we look forward to seeing you again in April. Thank you for your attention today. Stay warm tonight. I suppose some of you will probably get some ice. And thanks to all the panelists as well. I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm.